Um, I'm <laughs> for the Zetkin Collective. Um, Zetkin's I can still not really sure about that, but um, they wrote this book this year um, after forming two years ago around the human ecology department, which most people here know what that is. Um, and they're basically looking at the links between rising climate catastrophe and rising um, far right white supremacy. And um, they're really asking how does far right white supremacy and fascism relate to energy and ecology, in particular climate politics um, and fossil fuel dominance. So this book's title is Rift Off. I don't know if any of you know Franz Fanon, who wrote a book called Black Masks, for, yeah, Black, Black Skin, White Masks. And um, the main sort of, or one of the thesis in this book is that uh, the connection between racism and the environment is not really a connection, but it's part of the same uh, fundamental structure. Um, so that's really where this book starts. And it looks at the US, Brazil, and Europe. Whereas uh, us interns, we sort of go off on another tangent and look at things that we're not really focused on in the book. Um, this also this idea of like the rising far right or a rise in fossil fuels can be a bit misleading because, um, as they also talk about in the book, um, fossil fuels is seen by the collective as very homegrown in Europe as well as fascism, and they try to uncover how these histories are relevant to today. So the term rise can be a little bit misleading. Um, and the goal also for Zetkin is not to look at how, how uh, the far right exists in a vacuum, but how this relates to um, broader mainstream political narratives. So um, as a lot of leaders are sitting in Glasgow right now, um, it's pretty clear that fossil fuel dominance has and is championed by these sort of liberal ideologies of fossil fuel capitalism through more mainstream elites. And the anti-politics of the far right is seen by the collective as working in conjunction with this. So instead of being this sort of um, extremist, uh, radical um, group that's fallen off the political bandwagon, it's sort of existing on a continuum of ideas that are there, but they're expressed more radically by these far right groups. Um, so this connection for Zetkin between the far right and mainstream politics is really important, um, especially now as we hear a lot about this consensus of, consensus of a smooth transition to collective benefits of sustainable development, securitization, human rights, all being discussed in Glasgow at the moment. Um, and the perspective in this book is to show that this is not just naive, but it's also misleading of the sort of um, really polarized reality that we live in. So it ignores history, ideology, elite interests, and most importantly, the environment. So you probably gathered already that the sort of main um, starting point of studying the far right for the Zetkin Collective, so for all of us interns, is looking at this relationship between far right racism and climate denialism or eco-fascism. These ideas are understood as being really historically built through European colonialism and empire. Um, probably some of you are familiar with this book. We had it in CPS. And it's really sort of the first broad overview of how people were inferiorized because they didn't have Western technology. So because the West was seen as knowing how to control nature and in order to control that nature, they needed to extract or remove local societies. And to do that, they had these various processes of dehumanization and delegitimization. Um, this might seem kind of um, obvious, but it's a, a bit of a diversion from how sociology and politics looks at uh, racism. So instead of racism being this sort of um, phenomenon just at the level of ideas that's this bad or perverse ideology, it's instead seen as this technological, scientific, social structure, and it's connected to specific um, processes of agricultural and industrial development. Um, and this structure is made up of projects of agriculture and extraction, which this book goes on to show all around the world, um, that, are, went, that went together throughout history with genocide and slavery. So 
the process in this is really linking people with land, people being tied to their land and their energy practices um, and their culture that came along with it had to be made to not exist or subsumed by the European culture that moved in. So what, the point of connecting these two things, energy and race, is really to say that modern racism is structured around particular Eurocentric technological energy practices. For the far right, this history is really understood in this way. And that's what, like, at least for myself, that's what we look at in this research is how this history is narrativized to show that Europeans treat land and resources in particular ways that are superior to other cultures and that other cultures are a threat to this. So, for example, in Australia, um, indigenous hunting and land is replaced by pastoralism and the destruction of native crops is replaced with the introduction of European or um, domesticated crops from the Middle East. And later is the introduction of mining, which is kind of where my research goes. So the whole land and ecology is changed alongside the racial politics of colonialism and um, settler colonialism then in Australia, in Australia's case is seen as a structure, not an event, which really means that it still exists today. We don't really have this post-colonial period in Australia. These structures that developed over a couple of centuries are still um, persisting today in different ways with new developments. Um, in Australia, the most common way that the land and the people there were understood was through the idea of terra, terra nullius, which just means empty land and wilderness. So you have this idea of both an empty land and a land full of unknown, uncontrollable um, people and species. So the idea here was that Europeans um, are uh, have this monopoly on being fully human because they can control and dominate land in a sort of proper way through these extractive processes. Um, any evidence of sophistication by the um, indigenous society was essentially erased or destroyed. So for example, in Australia's case, early settlers noticed that indigenous were collecting and harvesting uh, seasonally different um, native grasses in large quantities. But when this was written about, these pages were later removed from diaries or settler accounts. So the, and as one um, indigenous scholar uh, put it in an interview is that we weren't supposed to be human. Um, so this really meant in Australia, there wasn't this sort of one event of colonialism. There was a total replacement of one system, culture, a uh, legal system, agricultural system with a European one, which was seen by settlers as inevitable. So rather than subsuming local cultures or local labor, which is more commonly what happens in colonization in Africa and Asia, for example, um, the indigenous population and the, the energy practices on the land were completely replaced. This is uh, really similar to contemporary articulations of this idea, like Naomi Klein's idea of sacrifice zones, where whole, um, whole groups of people are essentially dehumanized to make way for changes on the land. So it's really the connecting of humanitarian issues with land-based issues. Um, and then, yeah, so that was sort of a bit of a historical look at how Zetkin developed this sort of land land energy race nexus but um, in Australia today this structure has given us one of the biggest fossil fuel exporters in the world it's the largest um, largest coal exporter in the world they have at the moment a hundred new um, fossil fuel projects in in the pipeline which means that they could end up producing five percent of world industrial emissions between 2020 and 2021, the government also gave 13 billion in subsidies to fossil fuel companies. They also are coming under a lot of fire at the moment for something called a revolving door. So this is where federal and state ministers after their political employment as lobbyists can work as lobbyists, consultants, board members for fossil fuel firms and vice versa. So um, board members and CEOs um, in fossil fuel companies are then taking on political careers and that's actually
this, which is a bit blurry, but yeah, the idea is not really the individual pieces, but these are all the connections between um, Australia's main parties and different energy um, companies, um, many of which are also global. So this sort of like public private um, revolving door, um, yeah, it's, it's, there's too many examples of this to count. Um, one of the uh, leaders of one of the most far right parties, Clive Palmer, he owns iron ore, nickel, coal holdings. He owns a number of mining companies. Um, he's also been in numerous uh, legal battles over humanitarian and indigenous rights issues. And um, there are a lot of people who look at this, at this and um, study the connections between these uh, public private spheres. And you can also see then how there's sort of this slide into from the conservative right into the far right. And there's big connections between these groups. Um, members of um, these far right parties in Australia, which I think might be too small to see, but yeah, generally one nation in the Australian National Party they um, they flip between these parties and also between the Liberal um, Conservative Party or the Liberal National Party, we call it. Um, historically, this sort of, um, yeah, love for extractivism by public and private moguls in Australia, it has always been steeped in racial racialization and colonization. Um, historically, racism and fossil fuels developed together, both as part of the far right and the conventional political narrative. Um, Australia became a federation in 1901, and the country's mining, fossil, uh, mining and fossil energy sectors went through a rapid expansion, which was um, financed and underwritten by state and federal governments. So from day dot, you had this big relationship between public and private. Um, at the same time, following the a century past of, of Indigenous genocide, the white Australia policy was introduced. So in 1901, the parliament uh, legislated to expel um, a few thousand Pacific Islanders who'd been working um, to labor in the sugarcane fields of North Queensland. Um, after this was achieved, there was more legislation. The Immigrant Restriction Act um, was passed to make sure that no other non-whites could be prevented, uh, no other non-whites, yes, non-whites, non-whites, would be prevented from coming to settle in Australia. Um, and this really did secure a white Australia. So this policy was, from that perspective, really a success. Um, alongside this white Australia policy, there was also uh, simulation policies that um, there was this sort of realization that the indigenous population was not a race that was about to disappear as it had been believed to be for the century before. And they um, introduced a, sim a simulation policy. And this is what we now call the stolen generation. some people might have heard of, which is a strengthening and maintaining of this white Australia policy alongside fossil fuel expansion was um, part of the main narrative of far right groups. It was many authors have argued what developed their ideology over that time. So maintaining this white Australia was central to this. But the policy itself was enacted by the mainstream elites, or they were considered mainstream elites at the time. So you still have this strong relationship between the two, where one is very overtly expressing um, racist sentiments, and then the other is putting these actually into policy. So. What this really means is that the Australian far right evolved against the backdrop of settler colonialism, fossil fuel expansion, white, the white Australia policy, and the need to maintain these three pillars in dialogue with the mainstream elites. There have been a number of far right groups and actors in Australia over the past decades. Um, these movements have often been described as not being as visible as the far right that we see in Europe and in the United States. But uh, part of my research is looking at, is this actually true and why would this be true? And one sort of possible suggestion is that they weren't as visible because far right sentiments in Australia 
are even more so folded into the national politics and cultural character. Or the more sort of obvious one that's been suggested is that to survive and get more support, far right groups had to be more tactical in their racism and it was more acceptable um, and more beneficial for them to be like this. This, hopefully, it will work again. Is it going to go on the screen? Oh, we need to exercise it. Yeah. Here we go. Um, this is just a timeline of <clears throat> some of the main main political uh, far right movements, <clears throat> both political and, and non political, um, since the 30s. <coughs> so at the beginning, these groups, um, these were the main ones, and they sort of split off into smaller, um, some more radical terrorist groups as well. But they were very explicitly um, neo Nazi groups using Nazi symbolism, Nazi salutes and chants, and um, I'd say like classic examples of overt racism. And then you see this sort of progression into, into the main far right group in Australia, I would argue, which was purposefully um, designed, I would say, out of leaders of these groups to define themselves in contrast to overt racism and they banned Nazi symbolism, Nazi chants, this sort of thing. And a lot of the far right groups that then followed followed these similar tactics. And the ones that did use these tactics of making their racism more coded, as you would say, or overt, uh, covert, they had more success. So the Australian League of Rights still exists today. And this is a problem for a couple of reasons. It means that the far right is more dangerous. So figures like um, Tarrant, who did the um, 2019 Christchurch shootings, um, they understand, they're shown in their manifestos to understand this, that um, to gain public support and more power, there is this need to uh, sort of codify um, and contrast yourself to particular types of racist expressions. Um, and groups that didn't do that, like some of these more recently, um, were quickly, uh, quickly lost power or, or lost momentum. There's kind of, <clears throat> An, an exception to this rule um, in 2020, um, which is also the other problem. This makes it harder for people to understand what the far right in Australia really is, as opposed to groups in Europe and the United States. Um, there's been this purposeful attempt to um, remain hidden and remain unseen. So in 2020, the National Socialist Network yeah, they had a gathering in the Grampians, which is a big national park in Australia. And <clears throat> they were, um, yeah, doing a bunch of Nazi salutes and using Nazi symbolism. And it was very clear that they were purposely trying to hide um, their movement. And um, we only know about them because a couple of journalists managed to infiltrate their group and find out more about their ideology. So this really shows that contrary to a lot of comments that the Australian far right is not as much of a problem, doesn't really exist, that it's just very good at going underground and that we need to look a bit harder and also understand how they do more. This kind of um, tactic, coded, tactical coded racism in order to get more support and last for decades. What's the color code between blue and green? Um, this is like, if it's an event, it put it like that, and then mm. green was if it's um, like a group. Okay. So, yeah, these are more um, evolved around uh, protests or particular terrorist acts, whereas the, the green ones are more actual functioning or did function groups. Okay, cool. Um, Yeah, so my research is uh, looking at these sort of contradictions and contrasts between all these far right groups. And as a lot of people have argued, it is really clear that there is a lot of diversity in these groups and they differ and have changed over time. Now these uh, more recent groups are called, you know, the new far right. But at the same time, um, um, and I mean, these contradictions aren't just this moving from one type of racism to the other. 
you have some of our right groups which are very Christian fundamentalist and some that are more um, new age spiritualist or Odinist, which is like an appeal to um, Nordic mythology. And um, there's a lot of these like contradictions, which makes a lot of people sort of try and argue that that there's like not really a way to define them. But um, in my research, at least, and in some things that have been done in Zethkin also, um, this con these contradictions are one way that you can define them. It is itself a, um, a definition of the far right. And you can also still find with or without Nazi symbolism, Christian or non-Christian, that there's this underlying appeal to um, something called civilizationism, which is really what my research is about. And I'll just, it's a kind of large topic, but I'll sort of explain it briefly. These are some uh, fun things that I get to read and listen to from the Australian far right. <clears throat> um, this is like a podcast. Um, yeah, so civilizationism, it's an ideological belief that white European descendants are superior um, cognitively, economically, socially, philosophically, and politically because of the success of past uh, European civilizations. So usually examples are made out of um, Rome, Greece, Prussia are the main ones. Um, what this ideology really says is that Europeans are superior not just because they are white, but because they have the best science, technology, and culture. Um, this civilizational structure is dominant, but it's also inevitable. It's the natural progression of the human species and can take different forms of language, move from Christianity to atheism, but they're always white and always based on European technologies, um, for example, in this case of extraction. Um, so yeah, here whiteness is really uh, not just existing on its own as this racial ideolo ideology, but is an archetype of the civilized European man. So, what this means is that racism is not only ideological, but also grounded in these very real and material environmental changes and realities of building civilizations and pro progress throughout history and into today. Um, in the Australian context, this meant that uh, indigenous Australians had to become the antithesis to civilization. And in a lot of this kind of literature, um, they're compared to wild people living in this sort of empty and dreamy wilderness. So part of the narrative is um, essentializing uh, Indigenous Australians as um, something completely different than what should be on this, on this land and how society should be conducted, how we should use energy, use our resources. Um, so it goes deeper than um, purely ideologies of, of race. Um, yeah, so the process of maintaining uh, progressive European civilizational structures is how racism is enacted into today using mythologies of the past. So um, a lot of this is uh, a lot of this type of far right content is based on revisionist histories of uh, past civilizations or or the industrial revolution. Um, and these continue to be reworked today into rationalizing, for example, the mining and degradation of indigenous land as this inevitable step forward um, into the civilized world for Aboriginal people. And this is yeah, present in the speeches of the Liberal National Party members, as well as groups along the far right. Um, yeah, and this is also clear in literature throughout history and up until now in Australia and in reference to Australia. Which there's some quotes there which I won't go into. Um, yeah, so what this means is that by using this concept, we can look beyond nationalism and the varieties of expression of white supremacy to see how this ideology is structured and ties back to Europe throughout time, um, but is not uh, historical, it's still relevant. Um, and also why Australian, uh, the Australian far right is can't really be understood just as an Australian issue because it's built on what I argue, at least in my research, is a mythology of European, not just identity, but European energy structures and civilization. Okay, so yeah, as I 
touched on, this connection between the far right and the liberal mainstream is an important component of Zetkin's work. And in Australia, this is no different. <clears throat> in some ways, the gap is even closer than in, in a lot of other Western countries. Um, <clears throat> despite the far right sort of civilizationist ideology that I also argue is a myth, um, fossil fascism is and has been put into action by mainstream parties and their revolving door of public private elites. So this is not really to say that the um, conventional institutions in Australia <clears throat> and the Australian far right are the same thing, but that they rest on the same material interests and depend on different expressions of the same mythology. And this implicates them both in racism and, <clears throat> and energy colonialism. <clears throat> um, conventional politics in Australia <coughs> Um, <clears throat> is more powerful in its capability <coughs> sorry, my throat is failing me. Um, to actually commit fossil fascism. So even though uh, these far right groups are very good at writing books and producing podcasts that express this uh, mythology, um, when fossil fascism is put into action and into uh, real life consequences, it's done by uh, the Liberal National Party or the Labour Party which are the mainstream parties in Australia. Um, one uh, real life example of this is the um, Carmichael coal mine, which is um, owned by a company called Adani, which is an Indian company, but it um, was developed with four and a half billion dollars in subsidies from the government in Australia. And some uh, financial investigations found that without these subsidies, this mine, would, mine wouldn't exist. This is the coal port, and you can actually, uh, maybe not on this, but on this picture, you can see the Great Barrier Reef in the background. So it's, uh, for obvious reasons, seen a lot of protest, um, but despite popular disagreement with this mine, it's still going ahead. Um, and they started uh, construction in 2019. So this mine is also supported by far right parties like One Nation, as well as, like I said, the two mainstream parties. They disagree over some financial details, but all the member, but many members in these parties have deep connections to the fossil fuel industry, as well as anti-immigration, anti-Aboriginal policies. They also have this sliding scale of members and candidates um, moving through from the conservative right into the far right. Um, so people who, you know, one member who, who was the co-founder of One Nation was previously working in the Liberal Party, and then members of one Nation. Um, one of the most infamous examples is the Queensland uh, Senator Fraser Anning, who um, became an internet sensation maybe here because somebody threw an A at him, but he also um, was, uh, yeah, he went viral for blaming the Christchurch attacks on immigrants in New Zealand, and he's got connections to the True Blue Crew, which is a militant far-right group in Australia. So yeah, when you start to look at, as that slide before, kind of looks into the different connections between um, leaders and public private members of the fossil fuel industry, there's this uh, sliding scale between um, neoliberal conservatives and into far right non-political groups. Um, so when looking at these different actors and their pasts, um, you can see that this energy colonialism in the form of the Adani coal mine is in full swing, Australia. Okay. Yeah, so that's a sort of broad overview of or introduction to hopefully help you understand the connection between energy and racism and how Zetkin slash myself understands this in this context. But because I'm here at Global Action, I thought it's better to, I, I tried to think more about what this means um, for activism and have been trying to, yeah, sort of ponder on um, how this sort of academic work or the book can help with uh, the problem of the far right or fossil fascism. Academic work can be very insulary and it often, though it thinks about things happening in the real world, um, often it can be really detached from the real world. So this was, yeah, more to maybe spark conversation on this topic. Um, the collective also, uh, I should definitely say, does want to bridge this gap between um, academia and activism. 
between thinking and acting. Um, <clears throat> and I think that they can definitely play reciprocal roles. At least my opinion would be that academic thinkers can check on where activism is heading, um, whether some actions maybe end up doing more harm than good. And activists can also stay engaged in development and critique of ideas and hold academics more accountable for these things that, you know, Zetkin Collective spends a long time talking and writing about actually becoming something that helps to address these very scary um, and intense problems. Um, yeah, so the real question is, how does this knowledge help us to do something about the problem? I would say that unless we unmask the culture and mythology of fossil fascism or environmental racism, we can't begin to do something about the physical effects of racism and the environmental crisis that the far right is intent on perpetuating and exacerbating. Thank you.